just to remind you, when you write your assignments, you should be very, very thorough when you make references to sources that you use. Um, and it's <coughs> we have mentioned this before, I think, but it's it's you are allowed to to cite, and you are also allowed to cite things word by word. But you shouldn't make your assignment, uh, or the or the share of your assignment should not be, or your assignment should not be characterized by <laughs> direct citations from from sources. But but a small fraction of your uh, assignment can be like that if if it is convenient. But then you should uh, have it in uh, in uh, quotation marks, and and give re references to the source. Because there was a <coughs> discussion when I came in here about uh, about various ways of cheating at the exam, and we have actually had some problems uh, with assignments that are submitted and which are obviously taken from the internet or from other s sources. And we have a we have a program. Or a, or a device here with where we can check that. So we can run all the submitted assignments through a, an electronic check for, for that kind of, uh, of issues. And we do that in, uh, in, uh, in most cases. And I do it always. And if there are lots of cut and paste, then in the worst case, maybe that you are expelled actually, for, for cheating. But uh, it, uh, it doesn't happen often that uh, we, we go that far, but it has happened. So please just pay attention to that and nothing, no problems will, uh, will, uh, will occur. Just make the correct citations and everything is fine. Research is a bit about building upon sources and work of others. Otherwise, you, ris you, 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 you run the risk of inventing the wheel all over again. So it's fully acceptable to cite others. OK. Uh, <coughs> trucks in intermodal transportation. Uh, small units, uh, not, not too expensive. The capital investments are not that high. Um, flexible, also when it comes to capacity adjustments up and down. Nice things about trucks is that it is a sec it's a, it is a fairly good second-hand market. So if you need if you run into issues where you need to get rid of capacity or you need to purchase more capacity, it's quite easy. And that is, uh, it's an important difference between this market and, uh, and the rail, and particularly the sea transport market, where you have big units, and it's much more expensive to, to enter and also to exit from this market. There are some restrictions connected to road transport, which, is, uh, which has to do with, uh, with local environmental issues. You see some of them here, uh, where you don't want to, to have too much truck tra transport uh, on weekends, for instance, on, uh, during night time and so on. This is not a problem on the, on the main highways, but it is a problem in the cities and in the, in the more densely populated areas. So th these are just, let's say, restrictions that, that you need to take into consideration as constraints when you plan the, the transport services. It's no use to promise somebody to deliver something, let's say, within this time span or right after that uh, if, if you cannot use the roads at the time, so of course. Yeah important to be aware of them. There are some maximum uh, weights on the, on the, on the vehicles. Um, 
50 ton, 19 meters of length, and uh, a bit longer for uh, for timber transport. Um, there are some uh, differences between Norway and uh, and the EU, um, and we have these trials going on for longer trucks. Um, and uh, these trucks have the nice characteristics that they are bigger, they can carry more cargo. And uh, there are some claim benefits because you can have you can employ fewer trucks to to carry the same amount of cargo. There are scale effects connected to uh, to engine sizes and things like that. So the emission rate per ton, given the, a certain load factor, is less for these trucks because you 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 don't increase the size of the engines at the same rate or the outtake of power at the same rate. Um, and then the, the, the ones that advocate these, these long trucks, you see there are different configurations allowed. Um, and in, uh, in other countries, like for instance Australia, you have much longer vehicles than this. You may have three units, for instance, like this. It's a kind of a tr truck train. But uh, in parts of Australia, you have the road going like this. No bends, no narrow mountain roads or, uh, or anything like that. So it's possible to, to operate them. But I mean, you have seen the Norwegian roads, <coughs> so you could easily foresee some changes, uh, some, uh, some not changes, but challenges connected to, to the long, to the length of these vehicles. So <coughs> given that you can use this capacity efficiently, uh, the model trucks are uh, considered as being, being efficient. And there has been evaluations of these trials because this, these are not allowed everywhere. They are only allowed on certain parts of the road network because of, uh, of uh, technical limitations. As I said, you cannot run these trucks on, uh, on, uh, on the narrow parts of the road network with sharp bends and things like that. It needs to be a developed road network. But uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's uh, and, and within the EU, they are, uh, they are termed um, EMS, which stands for European Modular System. European Modular System. So, <coughs> um, if these are taken or put into operation on a, on a specific link, carrying a given amount of cargo, uh, they can, one or um, the number of ordinary trucks can be reduced by some 20 40 percent. based on empirical evidence. So <coughs> um, one could measure the, um, let's say, the impacts. Because when you are, when you are going to, to do, let's say, if you are in a position of being an authority here, and you, sh you should decide whether you should allow for, for bigger trucks like this in the network or not. You could assess it for the private sector, impacts for the private sector. And then we talk about 
transport costs. We can talk about it in terms of environmental impacts. Try to structure what type of impacts that we can, can look for. Uh, traffic safety. We can also <coughs> look at traffic flow impacts. It's for the camera. And then <coughs> public sector costs. public sector costs. So if you are in position as an authority, as a, as a, as a planner or an advisor in the for the authorities, you're going to see should we allow the European modular system trucks to be implemented on a specific part of the road network. We can try to work out how we should assess this. And that's why we often start with trials. We try to see whether this works on a limited part of the network. And we try to measure it in terms of, uh, of uh, key performance indicators. And the key performance indicator for private sector is uh, transport cost. When it comes to the environment, you have the KPIs that I showed you not last week, but the week before. Um, you could also have noise as a as a in in populated areas as a as a factor. Traffic safety, number of casualties, people that are uh, are hurt or or even which uh, may be exposed to fatal accidents. Here, this is a very interesting one because. They are bigger. They may have, in a way, relatively, in, in, in a relative sense, smaller engines. So it's about speed impacts for other traffic. If these trucks causes delays for other road users. Could be important because if 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 that happens, it uh, the the value can become quite high. And this this is like administration, admin costs, etc. So you can try to break it down into various impacts. Select the relevant key performance indicators and then start gathering information. And then compare with ordinary truck services. Because that will be the, be the main competitor in this uh, in this respect and um, there has been 
done some uh, evaluations uh, in, in, in Norway on the, on the Norwegian trials on, on these module, module trucks. And um, the conclusions is that uh, all in all, if we count the reduction in transport costs, count uh, reduction in CO2 emission costs, there will be impacts here because the number of truck movements are lower, right? Because, as I said, one such truck can replace, say, 1.2 to 1.4 movements of ordinary trucks. Um, this is also f from, let's say, more or less the same change in truck movements and maybe some effects from other engine configurations and so on. Uh, transport cost has to do with the, with the, with the unit costs. That, can, that is, can be expected to be lower for, for, the, for the module trucks. They cost a bit more, but they carry 20% uh, more weight and more volume. So the, <coughs> the evaluation from the trials in, in, in Norway, uh, the, the results turned out as positive for, these, uh, for this uh, experiment or trial with the module trucks on specific roads in Norway. This seemed to be, um, at least at that scale of operations, uh, a net benefit to the society measured along these di dimensions for, uh, for these, uh, these truck services. But it remains to be seen if you implement it on, let's say, a denser road network with sharper bends and things like that, you may violate this, uh, this aspect, speed impact for other traffic, because things may slow down and um, the impacts on the, on the rest of the uh, road users may be, uh, may be stronger if you implement it on a in a larger scale. So the conclusions were that module trucks or uh, EMS trucks is good on selected links, but not so good if the, uh, of course, if the road network and the urban road networks are often the limiting factor here, uh, is not uh, suitable for this, this type of operations. So there are limits, but, uh, but it seems to, to work, work quite well. Um, and the number of trucks, reduction in, t um, in the area of 20 to 40 percent is also good for the, may also be good for the, uh, let's say, when you have constraints in, in, the, in the road capacity. As you have in many, let's say, m on, on many European roads, there are congestion, often due to the number of uh, heavy goods vehicles. I've tried to, to drive from, from Kiel in Germany and to Paris. It's, quite, it's some years back now. I don't think it has improved since then. But I was more or less standing constantly in, in, uh, in some line and there was a lots of lots of trucks that were uh, partly causing this uh, this congestion. Um, so you have, as I said, moderate investment cost per unit. Door-to-door -door solutions creates pressure on road capacity. 
and this, these external effects that co uh, is caused by, by slowdown in the transport network. Which causes reliability issues? Because this introduces variance in the lead time for the cargo, which is not a good thing for the, for the customers. It's better for the customers to have, let's say, a, a set time of arrival and low variance as compared to a situation where you, where you have, let's say, a shorter lead time and you have a lot of variance around that set time. So that is uh, the um, trucking companies are often setting the schedule so that they can include the variance of in the lead time in, the, in their scheduling so that the, 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 um, the driving time is sort of uh, given as longer in the timetables than it, use, than it needs to be if this slowdown and uh, external time costs were not present. So overall, <coughs> in this country, the congestion problems are very low. They are very low as compared to what we see in Europe and in many other countries. So in this country, road transport is, is considered as being fairly reliable if you disregard some, some, uh, some uh, disruptions in the road network caused by weather conditions and, and things like that. But it's not much congestion problems. But in many European countries and other countries, this is actually a big issue. <coughs> so we can have a short look at what what these congestion problems actually means more from from theory um, this is a situation where we try to illustrate congestion those of you who have had a, a course in transport economics would probably recognize this this uh, situation, but for others it may be, may be quite new. Have any of you seen this before? Congestion pricing? Okay. Some have, some, some haven't. This is a situation where you have volume on the horizontal axis, same for all three situations. This is a capacity constraint. So this is set as a capacity constraint in the network. It could be road capacity. Could also be vessel capacity. So it's the re the reasoning is the same. But since we uh, we consider congestion in the infrastructure and how we should deal with that. Um, uh, then we can consider this as a constrained infrastructure capacity. This is demand. It's a demand curve, downward sloping. These horizontal lines here are marginal costs of, of um, using the transport network, including the costs of usage that are imposed on others, on other users. Meaning that when the network is about to be congested, that things start to take longer time, one extra vehicle that enters the network will cause a slight slowdown for all the others as well. This is uh, 
rooted in, uh, in uh, empirical evidence as well as, uh, as, as queuing theory. But you should just accept this statement that when you have a congested network and one extra vehicle is trying to enter that network, the slowdown of speed in the network as a whole decreases slightly. So all other users that are there in the first place will spend a bit more time in the network. In this situation, we have excess capacity because if we then charge, and we should do that, we should charge the road users for using the roads according to the short-run marginal costs. And that is basically the cost of wear and tear of the road infrastructure. It's the, it's the vehicle operating costs for the, for the freight companies, including fuel costs and so on. So that is more or less included in the, in the fuel costs because we have certain, uh, certain taxes on fuel, which is supposed to cover, uh, and we're talking about road transport here, so we're they cover the emission costs, the wear and tear costs, and of course the costs of providing the fuel, including distribution of fuel and everything. But here, we have excess capacity, and we, then we don't price anything more than the price that is in embedded in the fuel costs for the, for the trucks. But here, <coughs> this is when the network is about to, or it has actually exceeded, the demand has exceeded the capacity limit. This is Drawn, drawn here as a solid vertical line. In reality, it will increase and then go straight up. The, the capital the capacity cost becomes uh, infinite. But here we have congestion. Um, the costs have start, uh, has started to, to increase because of the slowdown in the network. So now traffic is starting to move slower and then if you then still keep the charges to the short run marginal costs, meaning that you don't do anything about it simply, then you have an excess demand a demand that cannot be served by the existing capacity at, and you may add at the, uh, or so within the time slot, so that's where you have the congestion. The traffic is standing or it's moving a lot slower. So we get, uh, you get less traffic through the network. So these, this, demand here, they need to stand in, stand in the li line and wait for the capacity to be available. That is in practice what we experience when you, are, uh, when you are standing still, waiting for the traffic to move a little bit, and then you stand still again. So but from a society's point of view, if you then introduce congestion pricing, which is a big issue in, uh, in, in many cities. London has it. Oslo is uh, discussing it, and I've done that for uh, 10 years at least. Um, all the bigger cities are discussing it. Not many have in, in, uh, introduced it yet, but London has. If you set the price of using the road network a bit higher during this congestion period, you get rid of this excess demand. The flow is improved. And that means that those with 
willingness to pay less than the fuel cost plus the charge, they will not go at this time. They may just not go at all, or they may change to time of day, where the flow is like this, let's say in the middle of the day, you avoid the morning and afternoon peak in traffic, and they don't have to pay anything, apart from the fuel costs. So the logic is that you improve the, the um, flow because you get rid of this excess demand. And the discussion is, what about these people with not that high willingness to pay? As I said, two options, change the time of travel or, s or uh, do something else. That means not travel at all. So this is when the, when, the, when the morning peak starts to build itself up. And then you have the third situation, where demand is extremely high. This is the, during the peak time at worst. And when I shift the demand outwards from this origo point here, that means that the volume is building up and volume times the, or you can also see this from an individual uh, motorist point of view, we have a very high willingness to pay during peak hours. Because then you're going to work, you need to be at work at a specific time, or uh, <coughs> you need to do something that involves use of a car, or um, a customer needs their supplies at a specific time. But all in all, it results in a very high demand. And if you draw this line out here, you intersect with this one, and you see that the, l that the line, the congestion or the queue, is very large if you still stick to the short-run marginal cost pricing, namely just to collect or to to let uh, the users pay the fuel costs and that's it, right? Then you get a very strong build-up of, uh, of, uh, of congestion, which is actually what you see in many, many areas. And then again, to get rid of this problem, <coughs> you should increase the prices. So then you have this varying, the prices vary then according to the level of congestion. To ensure that the flow goes, in this case, a lot of people willing to pay the short-run marginal cost, they will be squeezed out of this system. So they need to stop traveling or they need to go in the middle of the day where you have this situation. So you see it is a dynamic situation. And to make it even more complicated then, <coughs> if you have a demand that is of such a magnitude that it exceeds the long-run marginal costs of using the infrastructure, and the long-run marginal cost includes the costs of expanding the capacity to build new roads, more lanes, uh, and so on, then the optimal level of capacity expansion is this piece in terms of volume. Because that is the point where the users are able to cover the, the long-run marginal cost of capacity. So we don't expand it all the way to this intersection point out here but you expand it to the point where you have a balance between the long-run costs and, uh, and the willingness to pay the long-run costs. So you, you will still live with congestion. That's why economists say, and it's not popular among po politicians, and it's not popular among the road engineers, and I know because I said that yesterday to a bunch of road engineers, 
that you should always have some kind of congestion in the network. Otherwise, you have invested too much. And I don't like it. Because they want to expand capacity all the way out here. But then you don't have enough demand to cover the long run costs. So what I'm saying here <coughs> is that capacity needs to be priced. You could translate this to not infrastructure, but capacity on, on, a, on a given transport mode. Let's say if you have um, an, an air cargo operation or a, or a sea-going vessel ship operation, you may have these these problems there as well and then you can you can offer very cheap fares or uh, or uh, or um, rates in the off peak period and you increase the rates when you have a lot of demand a demand that exceeds your your capacity limit because this is demand that cannot be be served by your capacity so these are the number of containers that are left on the on the onshore, which cannot be taken on board because of this capacity constraint. So if you have a situation like that, you are, uh, and if you are a ship owner, you are in a very nice position because then you have market power, right? You can fill your ship, you can charge for it. If you are in a very competitive situation where a lot of capacity is available, you are stuck with this situation. You, you, you cannot increase your rates because then, uh, I mean, the demand is not there, simply. Yep. I heard uh, the government is discussing uh, reducing the prices uh, at night, for example, mm -hmm. instead of increasing at day. Uh, the toll taxes and uh, mm -hmm. bumping. Mm -hmm. uh, does that have the same effect? Yes, in a way, because um, it could have. What we say as, as, as economists, uh, and that was a part of my, my talk yesterday, because we, we submitted a report on, a, on an urban transport infrastructure program. We said that instead of having a flat rate of, let's say, uh, three euros or something, 25 Norwegian kroner, to pass all night, all day, you should cha charge perhaps five euros during daytime, during, um, let's say, from six in the morning to, to nine, and from three in the evening to six. And then you should have perhaps zero, for the rest of the day and the night, but you need to d uh, you need to dimension the the rates based on these demand and demand conditions, because if you just lower the rates during night time, you can do that because of this situation. But if you keep the rates during daytime or peak time at this level, for instance, you are still left with a certain amount of problems. So you should raise it a bit more to get, get to here. And if you need to raise it to this level, you need to expand capacity. So, so we did a study uh, in a specific urban area, which concluded that under cert certain conditions you, might, you may end in this situation, and then you should expand the road capacity. And when you think about it, as a, this has supply chain implications. That's why I'm dealing with it. Because if you are demanding your delivery as an end customer at 8 o'clock in the morning, then if, if you have an active dynamic pricing regime like this, then the freighter have to say to the customer, 
that you can get your cargo at 8, but it will cost you a lot. But if you can wait until 12, midday, it will be much lower. But if you, if you insist on having your cargo delivered in the morning, you have to pay for it. And this goes with also, let's say, sea transport. If you have a constrained capacity on a container ship, you should communicate that to the, to the customer that, well, if you can avoid this point for your delivery, I can reduce the rates because then the capacity situation is much better. Um, so it's a, it's a dynamic thing. It's valid both for infrastructure, it's valid for, uh, for vessels, and also, also for trucks in some, some cases. Um, and it has implications because it gives signals to the customers that if you move your required time of delivery to an off-peak period, you can get much better off. And then they need to communicate to their customers again that, well, the system works like this, there are different prices, and if you can adjust your, uh, your, uh, your um, demanded time of, arri of uh, delivery to a certain point in time, you can get better off, and then you have all the planning and everything connected to that. If we talk about intermediary products that are going to enter into a just-in-time production process, for instance. The whole process may actually need to be changed because of this regime. And that's why it's so hard to get this implemented in, uh, in many areas. What is a mystery to me is that when you implement this, you reduce travel time variance because you get rid of of the congestion. It's much easier to give an exact time of arrival. And there are lots of nice things connected to this, which, which gives also a lot of benefits to the, to, the, to the society and to the cargo owners also. Because the system will, will work better, more, more reliable. And, uh, but at times, you have to pay more. But you get more as well. So it's a way it's a way of thinking that has been around since I don't know when before I w even I was born. It's a guy called William Wickery who came up with this. I get I think he get got the no Nobel Prize in Economics some some years ago for uh, for this uh, among other things this this concept. But um, and it's about to be implemented. But it's uh, and it's all it's also a bit about technology to monitor when when you get this kind of capacity pressure in the road network, and then you can uh, you can have a very dynamic pricing structure. The technology for doing that is about to be implemented now because you have um, cell phones, mobile phones, GPS in your car, so you can monitor. If you are using a congested part of the road network, you have to pay more. If you can choose another route without, you shouldn't pay. So we can do this on a very, very fine-tuned level with the technology available. And then you have all kinds of legal issues connected to tracking and uh, personal security and everything, which complicates it. But uh, as a concept, it's it's quite appealing, I think. Did you? Did you get the intention here? Yeah, good, logic. Rare, we break again. <laughs>